Ian, thank you for uh, joining well, me today. It's uh, 50 years, a career spanning 50 years in the nuclear industry. Um, what have been the particular highlights for you within your career? Well, the highlight was getting my first job at Harwell, oddly enough. Right. It was, um, I came from Kettering Grammar School and uh, got my physics A-levels. Um, I was a bit dodgy thinking getting into university, <laughs> so I got a job as a standby as much as anything, and the standby was what came up. Right. But uh, mm. I went to Harwell, and yeah. uh, it was beautiful. In the early 60s, right. fantastic scene then, you know. It was, nuclear power was really uh, you know, the big thing. And um, I was a lab boy, and I was in working with, you know, supporting top scientists. It was exciting. I mean, I guess some of the top scientists in the UK were there at the time you were there. Oh, they were, yeah. I mean, really, really were. I mean, I used to play rugby there, and Lord Penny would come out to watch. You know, and he was the father of the bomb, you know, in Australia and all sure. of that. But um, another thing was, we didn't quite appreciate, it was after the Windscow disaster, yeah. uh, they were worried about Vigna energy release and if it was a big no-no for nuclear power. They did experiments on BEPO, you know, a graphite reactor in Harwell. Oh, right. And when I was there, half the scientists were dead scared and half of them were all excited. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I noticed one of the things that you worked on these Dido and Lido yeah. uh, reactors, uh, and I think you were explaining to me just briefly, uh, just a short while ago, that these were to test the reactions of materials. To yeah, the the uh, effects of radiation on material properties. Right. Okay. You know, because uh, up to then people knew that you know, material properties with heat and uh, you know, various other things, pressure and things. You know yeah. what happened, but uh, not radiation. And yeah. uh, radiation had big effects on, you know, molecular structure of materials. Sure. And they were there just to irradiate materials and see what happened and if they were, you know, what their lifetimes were and, um, right. you know, high irradiation conditions. Sure. And, and did, Dido did, and Pluto were designed to be high radiation flux reactors. But right. reasonably low power, of course, sure. you know, but very high flux. Hmm. Yeah. And this gave us guidelines then to the, the reactors that we're building today, I guess. That's right, exactly. Oh, well, yes, yeah, all the material properties now are... Yeah. from you know, what, what was evaluated way back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I noticed from what we were talking about before that you went to Harwell on the grand total of about, well, less than £10 a week. In yeah, £4.95 time. Pounds a year. £4.95 pounds a yeah. year, a king's yeah. ransom at that time. Well, uh, the big thing was that uh, we lived in a hostel, the apprentice hostel. Right. Uh, and um, that was £3.1 and six a week. <laughs> but it was it took out of your salary and it depended on the number of Thursdays in the month. So if it was a five Thursday month, you were three pounds down, oh, which right. was yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, it was a lot of with beer, a shilling a pint. You know? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah. moved from there, as I understand it, to Rolls Royce. That's that right? right, Rolls Royce and Associates and the Rainsway at Derby. Right. Yeah. And was that working on the submarine side at Rolls Royce? Yes, Ro it? they had a, a zero energy reactor there, which was the uh, replica of a, a submarine core, and there again, that was to see what you know, sort of work out flux patterns. Right. Um, they actually uh, used to put foils, you know, uranium foils in the phone, measure them, count them, the activities, and then uh, see if the actual theoretical programs that predicted flux patterns, how they tied up with what actually happened, you know. Right. And there was also experiments on um, doing poisoning certain plates, you know, nuclear absorption plates, sure. so that you damp down the high flux um, peaks you got in uh, water areas, you know, where the yeah. rods went. Right. Yeah, it was so, good. So, and uh, I noticed when we, uh, the previous discussion we were having that, you had to travel to Dune Ray as well. Yeah, that's right. What yeah. was the reasons for Well, it had a full power Ray? reactor at Dune Ray, right. a replica of a submarine corps where they yeah. used to train the operators yeah. on there. And also, we did experiments to find out what the effects up through the lifetime of the submarine corps were. Sure. Again, I was just sort of part of a junior member of a team. Yeah, because you were a young lad. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Things, but yeah. we used to uh, go up there by train, first class sleeper. Right. And uh, we used to get paid overtime oh, even while better. I was sleeping. Yeah, 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 oh, yes, yes, it was uh, It was all right. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine, yeah. So yeah. you did that for, what, a couple of years? For Two and a half years. Two and a half years, right. Uh, what happened then was that they'd uh, actually refined the S5W core, which was the submarine core they'd bought from... Admiral Rick over the American Corps, right. refined it to call, it was called Core B, yeah. and then they decided they didn't want uh, the research reactor anymore for any more development work. Right. Uh, the Navy were going to spend the money on 
torpedoes up in, I think he was up in Shetland or something. Oh, right. So um, I transferred into the shielding group. Right. And that was where you um, effectively measure the, well, sort of predict the radiation levels at operating areas outside the reactor compartments, right. you know, to make sure it's in a safe operating environment. Sure. I, I quite like that, and, it, you know, I found it was very fulfilling work, but... Again, it was just on one single reactor for a submarine. Yeah, I was so going to say, because you made uh, an unprecedented decision, didn't you, to yeah. move from sort of submarine work into civil nuclear. That's right, it? to the civil nuclear, just down the road in Leicester, right. at the GC consortium at yeah. uh, Whetstone. And I thought that was a, uh, well, perhaps a, a good move, you know, and sure. uh, there was a better future in it. Right. Which, which there was, in fact. Yeah. Know, was this when you then went to work? Because uh, you tell a funny story about going for an interview and then... Yes, that was right. That's right. Was I went to the interview hole? there and uh, as part of the interview process, it was going pretty well, you know, yeah. and uh, so, so. And the chap said, uh, would you, you know, be akin to going on secondment to Harwell? And I said, oh, no, I used to work at Harwell. I liked it very much. Apparently the interview stopped then, and they said, oh, well, you better go along and see the personnel officer. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they'd had, as part of the um, shielding program development, um, the consortia, the, the, the shielding programs, the transport programs, were developed at Harwell, and the consortia who did the commercial designs had to provide people to support that program and also take the knowledge back to the uh, design you know, consortia, mm. and that was the theory. Well... They'd had, uh, Howell was very strict on uh, not letting foreigners onto the site. Now, uh, Rolls Royce, the people who were, you might say, possibilities for going there, one was a Pole, and they wouldn't have him, what? and the other one was uh, from Indian, and they wouldn't have him, you know, and uh, they were desperate for someone to go <laughs> so you <laughs> they could rely on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was, uh, yeah. major, but it was... That was a stroke of luck, I think. Yeah, it was, I did, right place, right time. That's right, respect. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely. you spent quite a bit of time, and that was that with a new uh, consortium called the NDC. Yeah, it was. It was, it was uh, GC formed a consortium with uh, Taylor Woodrow doing the civil works and Babcock and Wilcox doing the boiler, and it was called. Uh, it was when I joined. It was called NDC, Nuclear Design yeah. and Construction. They later changed the name to BNDC, British Nuclear Design and Construction. Right. But they had their own aeroplane. Oh, right, to, right. oh, yes. They used to keep it at uh, Stoughton Airfield in Leicester and we used to fly up to the sites and a uh, uh, Heron, right. you know, a uh, four engined, 14 seat aeroplane. It was wow. oh, quite good. Yeah. So, what did yeah. you go in there as well? Uh, you were there as a physicist? A physicist, yeah, yeah. Right, physicist, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the and, shielding group. And, and there was something we, which crops up when we were, we were talking about this before, is that, and I never had you down for this, so I was quite interested, uh, that you became a trade union man. Oh, yes, yes. I've, uh, I've always been uh, a member of the Labour Party, and uh, I think it's my father was um, socialist inclination. I came from a town, Kettering, which was a very strong co-op town. Right. My mother worked for the co-op, and yeah. I've always been very much on the left side of things. And... Um, it was quite amusing, really, because I'd been in there, hadn't been there long, and uh, the trade union guy, it was data, mainly the people, who, the engineers weren't really unionised, obviously, mm. it was mainly the draftsmen, but they said, how about join the union? And I said, well, OK, you know, I said, um, you know, I said what, what were they doing? He said, oh, we're going for a pay rise. <laughs> All right. So we had um, Category 2 and Category 3 staff, Category 2 staff were draftsmen and Category 3 staff were engineers and I was Category 3. Right. And they said they're going for £150 a year and a £100 difference between Category 2 and Category 3. And I said, well, if you get that, I said, I'll certainly join. <laughs> <laughs> that was, these are huge so figures. Good these are big though. figures. Yeah. Anyway, the outcome was they got the 100% differential between Cat 2 and Cat 3, but... They had a rider on the 150 a year across the board saying that if you were under 30, you'd only get 140. Right. So I was under 30 then, you know. Yeah. So the chap said, oh, I don't suppose you'll join if you haven't got the full amount. I said, crikey, yes, I will. I, said, that sort of I didn't thing. think you'd get half that money. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I was in the trade union and, and became the, well, we might say the convener, you know, leader there eventually. Right. Yeah, okay. it was quite good and I was there. Uh, looking after the staff when we had the move. 
Oh, when the TMPG became... Uh, <coughs> when, when the two consortia moved to form NNC. NNC, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, we, we merged with TMPG. There's something happened there. I vaguely remember you saying that. the uh, you, were, you were all out on the picket line at some point. Oh, we had, no, no. When we heard we were moving, we didn't. Right. people didn't particularly want to move from Leicester. <coughs> and sure. uh, so um, we weren't very happy, in short. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, uh, the guy who was going to head up this move called a guy called Rooney, mm. um, and uh, he came to the site the first day, and we all marched out to sign a protest. But the rain was coming down horizontally, <laughs> and uh, it was it was everybody came out, and we made our point, and then went back and said that's it. Right. But um, anyway, uh, Rooney didn't last there long, and uh, uh, his place was taken over by Ted Pugh, who was a great man. He was uh, came from the CGB, and he moved everybody up in the most amicable manner, right. and with a minimum of uh, discontinuity. Uh, a lot of people, it wasn't they didn't want to move, but they had children perhaps doing A levels. It was an awkward time for the it's very family. Very difficult, isn't it? I, I was very very fortunate because my two daughters were seven and nine, and it was a good time. Yeah. My wife had to give up her teaching job, right? But uh, we got one up here, and that was. You know, it wasn't too bad. Right. So um, you then move into thermal reactor assessment for the next generation of power reactors. Yes, that that's right? right. We were coming to the end of building Hartlepool and Hesham 1. Yeah. And uh, the government were looking for a replacement for the AGR programme. Right. And we had this uh, huge programme, which both TMPG and and uh, Aaron took part. We looked at all the various types of reactors yeah. that could possibly replace the AGR, uh, even included the Russian RBMK, which was the Chernobyl reactor, oh, right. and that was thrown out instantly. Really? It was, oh yes, it had a, a positive temperature coefficient of reactivity, uh, which mainly caused the Chernobyl reactor reaction, yeah. and uh, it had control rods that were power driven from below, which we didn't like at all. We preferred control rods to come in from the top and gravity fed, yeah. and it was... Um, it was completely, uh, it was completely undesirable for British. Right. It just wouldn't meet British licensing, you know, and uh, and it was rubbed out almost straight away. Correct. Quite oh. rightly, because yeah. Chernobyl just showed the it just showed the wisdom right of decision. that decision. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you were there at uh, you got involved with the Sizewell B, the PWR design. Yes, yes. And really. there was that dreaded public inquiry, as you refer That's to. That's right. Well, I, I worked for a, a very fine man called Mark Dutton. He was my uh, group leader. And he was one of the major witnesses at the uh, Sizelby inquiry. Uh, Mark was a boss a lot of the time at Weston, and he, he, he can't you know, rate him too highly. He was very yeah. good. He was very good. And uh, I've, I've always worked. I think if I ever say anything about my life, it's that I've always worked with people I've got on with. I've never had a boss that I didn't like right. or didn't like me. And that's been extremely fortunate, I think. Yeah. You know, extremely fortunate. Well, it certainly makes for a more pleasant working yeah, environment, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, not so I didn't give them any heartache. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to do that. But That's the way. The time, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was, it was good. It was yeah. good. Yeah. And uh, and then it, you know, time moved on, and uh, the Iron Lady herself, Maggie Thatcher, uh, cancels five replicas. Absolutely, of EWRs. that was a disaster at the time, and yeah, it imagine. turned out incredibly good for me. Yeah. Because we had to go into more varied work, instead of just working on standard PWRs. Yeah. and pushing these PWRs out. We had to look for other opportunities, and uh, the BXN project opened yeah. it up. You know, replacement called the whole project. Um, worked with the Russians, you know, from the European Union. It, it was it was very, very mm. good, you know. Yeah, I noticed uh, for, from looking at the, some of the background uh, of yourself, I mean, that you spent a bit of time working with the uh, EU and, and RF yeah, on, yeah. in Russia. So did, right, did yeah. you get many trips over to Oh uh, yes, to I, had, Russia, uh, I had a couple of trips to Russia. I went to Kalinin Power Station. Right. Um, that's halfway between um, Moscow and St. Petersburg. Sure. We stopped at a station called Vrishni Vorochok and uh, we uh, headed off through a big forest. And This is in the middle of winter, you know, there's yeah. snow on either side and all of a sudden the minibus we were in Veered all over the place. The guy had put the brakes on, and a moose had ambled out of the forest in front of the thing wow. and just won across the road. Wow. On the way back, we caught the train from Balagoya, and that was where, in uh, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, 
Anna Karenina meets Count Vronsky right. and the train stops there and falls in love. You know, that was where it all started. And it was good to go to that place, yeah, you know, okay. just to, yeah, the real thing. Mm. The Russians oh. said for every uh, sleeper on that railway, somebody died. Really? It was done by Nicholas I, yeah. 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 And I suppose the environment was quite inhospitable, really. As you, as it you wasn't that bad. No, no, mm. we, um, we we stayed at uh, Umalaga was the town by Kinenin, and uh, it was a, a modern town. It, it, we had a nice little hotel room and everything. Yeah, no, it was, right. it was out on the sticks, as you would say, but sure. it was such a huge country. Yeah. Yeah. And did you make any lifelong friends while you were around? Oh in yes, Russia, yes, yes. I say we had uh, we had a great rapport with the Russian colleagues. Yeah. Um, and I say they gave both both Mark Dutton and myself a book. Um, my book was a book of Kipling's poems, with uh, Russian on one side and English on the other. Right. Um, Mark had a book by Blake. <laughs> Yeah, which is a bit heavy, but Yeah, that's a bit heavy going there. Yeah. It's not good night time. Uh, I got the better of the deal there. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah. It, oh, he took us around the vodka distillery factory. Really? <laughs> yeah, he showed us all of Moscow. They showed us the White House, the Parliament. Right. Where Yeltsin had put shells through the White House to drive the rump Communist Parliament out. Really? And, yeah, and Dmitry said, Stalin didn't even do that. Wow. <laughs> the Russians had a very similar to the British. Yes. Same sort of sense of personality. Same queuing. Right. They're great readers, you know, big readers. Right. They really admired Dickens and uh, Kipling oh, and really? Shakespeare. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it was a, quite a, a good education that got oh, it was very, very good. Well, yeah. that, it was still the USSR in those, in those days, wasn't it? Well, it was called the Russian Federation. Federation then. Yeah, yeah it course. wasn't the USSR, no, it had yeah. broken up, but it was the Russian Federation, yeah. Okay. So, so you come back from there um, and... You know, you get involved with other things, but one of the things that you move into is looking at uh, assessment, safety assessments of shield doors at, at Sellafield. Yes, that was right. That was um, a project that had cropped up. Uh, the uh, shield door on the VIT line had opened inadvertently yeah. and uh, caused a bit of a stir. Sure. And I, I had quite rightly you know, wanted to know the reasoning and what to for. Yeah. And more or less told, I think, BNFL, it shouldn't happen again. Yeah. And unfortunately it did. <laughs> <laughs> so BNFL then gave a contract to NNC to do a safety assessment on all the shield doors in the whole of Sellafield and um, that project was initially managed by Jack Pugh and then Bob told me, that two fine engineers, sure. very, very fine, and, um, and we had small teams of a, a sort of a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer and a safety engineer, right. which I was so, so called safety. And um, the uh, you know we assessed all the shield doors you know for the interlocks and the level of radiation and the level of how high the interlock had to be and how effective it had to be. Yeah, it, it, that led to a very funny incident because we had to pass the uh, exam to be on uh, uh, go on to the Sellafield site. Oh yeah, and uh, we had to sit this the, go through the various procedures as, as you had to you know. And one of the things was you had to uh, answer questions, a test at the end. And uh, they had all these safety alarms, you know, about six or seven of them on the <laughs> field, different alarms. I got it wrong. <laughs> and it was a mandatory failure. Oh, really? <laughs> you got it wrong. They said, God, the safety man's got it. <laughs> yeah. How embarrassing is that? <laughs> oh, of course, everybody had a good laugh, you know, except me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, I went to that one. Was it around about this time that you got involved? Well, I had to sit it again. You know? Oh, you did? Yeah, oh, until yes. you passed it. The passed it, it. Until you passed oh, yes. it. So was it this time uh, in your life that you got involved with the Nuclear Institute, or was no, no, way, way before then. Oh, it was way, way before, before then. Way right, before okay. then. Yeah, I was in the uh, got involved in the Nuclear Institute. Well, it was the Institute of Nuclear Engineers and right. BNS then, but that was in the days when I was at Leicester. Right. Know, and okay. They, and they for a long, long while. Sure. Oh, yeah. It's a fine, fine organisation. You know. Yeah, uh, because I noticed that, and YGN are part of uh, obviously the Nuclear yeah. Nuclear yeah. Institute. But they awarded you Man of the Year, as I understand it. Yeah, that was another mistake, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I no, it was, uh, it, was, it was a very fine honour, and I was very, very pleased to get it. It was a bit of a surprise, but uh, yeah. yes, it was, it, it, it was very good of them. Yeah. yeah. But I, I noticed when you'd finished the, um, uh, the work that you did at Sellafield, you, you decided to take a, a little bit of an early retirement out of, out of the industry for a short period of time. Well, that was right. It was, I was in my mid-60s, and to be honest, I was really a, a shielding design engineer, and yeah. 
Shielding design is done at the front end of a design of a station. Right. We hadn't designed anything for ages and ages, and uh, it was mentioned to me at the uh, company that if I perhaps resigned from the shielding work, uh, then then I could activate my pension, you know, which was oh, yeah. had been frozen because the management buyout and sure. that sort of thing. I had a pension that had been frozen. Could activate that. Uh, stay off work for a little bit and then come back again into the marketing department oh, right. and promote the company through the work I did through the Nuclear Institute ah, right. and work for Alistair Smith and that and that was very well that was, it was like a footballer playing football you know you're doing it was it was brilliant you know it was beautiful yeah. and um, that was that was a great opportunity yeah. that was in 60 I was 63 then, yeah, it was seven years ago. Seven years, right. Yeah, okay. but and then when I hit 70, I thought, well, yeah. Enough's enough. Should enough. Back up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, so... Well, that was another thing as well, uh, I put it into NNC, was that uh, I was one of the first people to actually work past normal retirement age. Because uh, at 65, everybody would retire anyway. Yeah, normally and, it was mandatory, asked, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. And I asked if I could be kept on. They said, oh, yes, yes, certainly. Yeah, I mean... And I, they kept me on for many years after that. Because NNC was then sold to AMAC, as I understand it. Yes, yes. NNC uh, was... Uh, when they had the GC breakup um, because of the uh, mis-selling of... Well, uh, what was it? It was, it was part of Marconi Group that's you right, know, yeah. and all of that. And uh, Brian George, who was the father of the PWR, yeah. he was given a job, he was a GC director then, he was given a job to tidy up all these small companies that GC owned, of which NNC was one of them. Right. And it resulted in a management buyout under Paul Kershaw and 3i, and that, that saved the company, and, uh, and the employees and all their jobs. Right. And, uh, but it was a management, it was under funded, you know, as you could imagine, you know. Uh, the idea was that they were going to run it for four years, knock it into shape, and then 3 I would sell it and they'd make a profit. But then the stock market went to downtown, so we had the four years turned into five, six, seven years. Anyway, eventually, nuclear power became popular on the horizon, um, mainly through uh, Sir Ian, you know, and the canoe uh, yeah. campaign. And, um, uh, and GC... Uh, sorry, AMEC saw the, an opportunity there, but they didn't have the technical expertise. Mm. NNC had the technical expertise, but not the, you know, the financial back. Mm. So it was a marriage, ideal marriage, you know. And um, as I say, a AMEC bought NNC, and uh, that really gave the company a great yeah. uh, sort of foundation. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, you reflect back on the last fifty years. What's your view now on on the nuclear industry today? You know, have you got any well, views on that? Well, we're waiting now for the um, generic design assessment hmm. to come through. Uh, they had that blip of a blip with Fukushima, which Mike Whiteman quite rightly said, you know, we're not going to have huge tsunamis and earthquakes in Britain, you know, and uh, I think that report it threw up a few uh, question marks, but nothing that hmm. was out of the question, as you might say. Yeah, the um, it, it, it's looking good. I think I've mm. always thought nuclear power was the ultimate in uh, environmental friendly, mm. you know, generation of electricity. Yeah, it's safe. Nobody's been killed in the UK as a result no. of uh, no. nuclear, you know, electricity generated by nuclear power. You don't have the huge train loads of coal. Yeah, uh, you're not worried about your gas supplies. You know, you can put fuel in a reactor. It's there for five years, and it's sure. you can have a war, and you still going to keep things ticking Absolutely. over, you know, it's, yeah. uh, and it didn't take any space, hardly, just mm. a few football pitches, yeah. as opposed to wind power, which, for equivalent amount of power, needs half the county. That's right. You know, it's, yeah. um, it's, but there again, you do need wind, it does Yeah, it needs to be balance. a part of yeah. the energy yeah. mix, doesn't yeah. it, yeah. at the end of the yeah. day. Okay. Yeah. Now, you've retired, you know, the, the 70 now, retired, yeah. Yeah. Um, out of the industry. What are you doing to, to fill your time? Well, I, I work, I have a, I'm a secretary of the local SVP at Society of Vincent de Paul at church. All right. I used to, uh, just recently retired as chairman of a sea cadet unit. Mm. And um, also the um, gardening, grandchildren. Yeah. You know, there's always Grandchildren to, uh, always keep you yeah, busy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, on the sea cadet unit, actually, um, we, uh, Brian George, you know, harking back mm. to him, he was the, when he, he was the project manager of Sarswell B, but then he became the project manager of the Trident submarine project. And uh, 
met up and he mentioned that our secret unit was doing well in engineering and he said, well, bring them along and see, um, have a tour of Vengeance, the last of the transmarine being fitted out. Great. And we actually um, formed, along with the secret unit at Barrow, the Guard of Honour when Vengeance was launched That's and awesome. uh, finished up having the actual launch ribbons, the broken champagne bottle and everything. And it was Wonderful. in the... Um, Wardroom of the secret unit. Yeah, how nice is that? Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you still have an active involvement on the fringes of the Nuclear Institute. I yes, say. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, running the Northwest Dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the pleasurable bit, though. Yeah, right? it is. It's very pleasurable. Very yeah. pleasurable. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today, and it's oh, been great you. to hear about your career over mm. the last fifty years. And I hope you really do enjoy your retirement. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs>